Hello, and welcome to this week's class notes. Uh, last week, we talked about uh, writing a short analysis. And uh, so this week, I really want to focus much more specifically on reading Othello. Um, we're reading all of Othello this week um, from Acts 2 through 5 last week. Uh, you had read Act 1. Uh, so I just want to help uh, guide people through the reading of this play um, a little bit more detail. So um, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, so some things that I really want people focusing on as they're reading the play, and really the kind of the single biggest thing would be keeping in mind the idea that what we're reading is a manuscript and that this would provide the template for how a group of actors, a director, um, a crew would decide to perform the play on a stage in front of a live audience. So one of the most important things I want you to envision while you're reading the play this is true for any play, but you know we're reading Othello this week, is, is really thinking about what the performance might look like on a stage. So just as any act of reading requires interpretation, each time a play is performed, all of the people involved, from the director to the crew to the actors, must be actively engaged in interpreting the play so that they can make choices about how to stage it for a live audience. So there's been many, many adaptations of Othello over the years since it was first performed in 1604 up through present day, many versions of it on stage, on screen. Um, there's been versions of Othello set to music, you know, all sorts of things, many, many interpretations of it. So each, each performance is an act of interpretation based on what they think the play is about, based on their interpretation of different characters and their relationships with one another. You know, do you present Iago as this really horrible dude who is just pure evil through and through? Do you humanize him somewhat? somewhat? What about Desdemona? How do you present her? Um, what about Othello? So everyone, when you're producing a, a play for the stage, has to make a lot of choices about everything from, as you'll see here, what the actors would, um, where would the actors be on the stage? So how would you, how would you position them on the stage? What would the set look like? The costumes, the theater itself? Uh, who would you cast in each role? How would you have different actors read their lines? What should they be doing with their bodies during each moment of the scene? What kinds of responses would you anticipate from the audience that, at different parts of the scene? And what kinds of responses would you want that, to, that scene to invoke from them? So there's a lot of choices that you have to make um, when, you're, when you're performing something on the stage. All of these considerations and much more are essential to appreciating that any play is both a written text and a document meant to be interpreted into a live performance. So with that in mind, um, you read about the Globe Theater and the, and the nature of theater houses in the late 16th and early 17th centuries in Norton. <clears throat> and so um, you should imagine as you read Othello, the performance happening here at the Globe. So here we've got, now there's not actually um, any direct evidence about uh, exactly what the layout was like of the original Globe. The original Globe actually burnt down um, so what we have, have here on the left-hand side of the screen is an artist rendition of most likely the, the, the basic layout of um, what the globe would have looked like. Um, you see that you've got the stage right here. We've got these rising tiers on top of one another. Um, these were the more expensive seats. And then down here is the area, the cheaper seats where people could stand. This is the, the modern day. Someone actually decided, uh, I think it was 1949, to try to replicate the original globe. And so that's what this building is. Um, and you can see you know, all the people kind of arrayed up here, these seats are more expensive. This is for all the audience to stand, so this is where the commoners would be. Um, and here is the stage itself. And you can see that there's people on all sides of the stage, on both sides and the front, um, so they can see pretty much from all views except for the back. Uh, I have been to the Globe. It's a really amazing place to see Shakespeare performed, not just for its historical associations, but it's kind of exciting. I know I paid for standing room only and just standing there, you know, a few feet from the stage, having the actors that present right there in front of you is just a really unique experience. So um, there are many, as I mentioned, live performances of Othello. You can get film versions, you can watch. There's all sorts of stuff you can find online and on YouTube. Um, so for a, re a recording of a live performance uh, of Othello done right at the Globe Theater, click on the following two links below. So the video is very long. It's over two hours, I think. Um, it's divided into two parts. So even if you don't have time to watch the entire play, which probably many of you don't, I definitely recommend you try watching at least a few minutes 
by either watching from the beginning or you know pick a scene or you know play around with it maybe pick a scene that looks interesting to you um there, there's a lot in there i mean it's the the entire play so i think just seeing shakespeare perform can really help you to better understand the relationship between the text performance and audience that would have been so electric for early modern crowns and continues to be that's one of the things that makes um a play such a unique genre is that you can really see it embodied on a stage by live actors and not not only will each set of actors and, and a director make different choices about how to interpret it but from night to night or day to day the performances will change based on variations of all sorts of things all sorts of factors come into play there um so a few other special considerations when reading shakespeare uh, when you're reading his monologues uh, so whenever a character speaks for an extended speech but isn't addressing any other character on the stage, that speech is called a monologue. One way to interpret these monologues is as a form of inner thought expressed by a character out loud so that the audience has access to his or her thoughts. So if you think about the realities of a stage performance, you can't really get into someone's head, right? The way that like later on, when we get to later examples of literature, especially towards the end of the semester, we will have direct access to what characters are thinking. But if you have people on a stage, unless they're talking out loud their thoughts, we can't access it, right? So that's what these monologues represent is, is sort of getting at the inner thoughts of these characters. So notice how this access to a character's interiority, right? Their interior space or what's going on in their mind is a really radical departure from earlier medieval texts that focus on outward deeds and appearance. We see that definitely in Beowulf and Canterbury Tales we still have that. There is, there is in Canterbury Tales more of a sense of some individual um, differences amongst people, even, even though all the characters there are also representing types. There is a sense of kind of an individuality to them. And we do get a sense of, uh, some sense at least in Canterbury Tales, of um, these characters having some kind of a depth to them or some kind of um, maybe a hidden or private self that's different than their public self. And so that's a move towards what we see now in Shakespeare, which is really a more, much more fully developed interior life to all of these characters. And these monologues are one of the best expressions of that interior self. So pay special attention to these speeches as they provide key insights into a character's motivation. The very idea of a character as an individual with idiosyncratic motives is itself a crucial development in the history of British literature. So the idea of them having this sort of motive that um, we can't access unless we hear a character speaking out loud or watch their behavior. Um, these these um, monologues also feature some of the most powerful use of language and rhetoric in the play. And so the details of these speeches is well worth devoting close reading to. So any one of these speeches really you could you could analyze in great detail. Um, here's an example of one. This is actually uh, Othello speaking. Um, great example, there's, there's a number of them in Othello of these monologues. <clears throat> so here's one. Um, and this is uh, Othello speaking about sort of at this point, Iago started to plant the, really plant the seeds of suspicion in Othello's mind. So this is Othello reflecting on that. This fellow is of exceeding honesty and knows all qualities with a learned spirit of human dealings. If I do prove her haggard, though that her jesses were my dear heartstrings, I'll whittle, whistle her off and let her down the wind to pray fortune, happily, for I am black and have not those soft parts of conversation that chamberers have, nor, or for I am declined into the veil of years. Yet that's not much. She's gone. I'm abused. My relief must be loath to her. O oh, curse of marriage, that we can call these delicate creatures ours and not their appetites. I had rather be a toad and live upon the vapor of a dungeon and keep a corner in the thing I love for others' uses. Yet, tis the plague of great ones, prerogative as the less than the base, are they less than the base, tis destiny unshunnable like death. Even then, this forked plague is fated to us when we do quicken. Um, so, you know, I apologize for my bad acting, but there you go. You know, there's one sense of, that. that is a fellow, that's sort of, you know, what's on his mind, and he's speaking it out loud, and you could see him wrestling there with whether or not he should trust Desdemona and what he's going to do with her and, and thinking about and reflecting on the nature of marriage. Uh, so just like reading monologues is really important and sort of thinking about those as a special circumstance, 
Reading dialogue is also a skill to work on. Um, so in the spirit of reading Othello as both a written text and a living document meant to be interpreted so as to be performed, you should read dialogue between characters as both text and speech. <clears throat> so as a text, dialogue in this play is heightened from everyday speech and also written in a way to reflect the character and class status of the speaker. Thus, no the nobility speak one way, commoners another. At the same time, the dialogue spoken by characters is meant to resemble everyday speech. And thus, not only are all of the plays written and performed in English, but the meter or the pattern of emphasis is meant to simulate natural speech patterns. So this is what's called iambic pentameter. Um, you read about this in Norton as well. But it's really crucial to understanding the um, style in which these plays were written. So to achieve this effect of, of, of um, simulating natural speech, Shakespeare uses iambic pentameter. Uh, we also saw this in Chaucer. We're going to see it again in Milton, which simply put means that every line contains 10 syllables and alternates between first an unstressed and then a stressed syllable. This sounds complicated, but really all it means is that your voice should rise and fall rhythmically when you read most of the lines in Shakespeare. This also includes the monologues. So note that many lines in Shakespeare don't perfectly match iambic pentameter because they don't have 10 syllables or because they don't perfectly match iambic meter. So there's lots of variation here. Um, more often than not, you'll see most lines in Shakespeare do, do have 10 syllables and they start with an unstress and move to stress and keep going back and forth. But there's lots of variation and that variation is often done intentionally to achieve different kinds of effects to highlight certain lines or certain words. Um, note that uh, uh, also some characters speak in prose instead of poetry, such as the exchange between Iago and Rodrigo on pages 578 to 579 of our textbook. And again, that's done to achieve a certain kind of effect. <clears throat> so try reading some of Othello out loud to hear the rhythm of iambic pentameter. We've been talking all semester long about the importance of trying to read some of this out loud to hear it um, and hear Give that a try, you know, read, read, a, read some passages of dialogue out loud. You'll really be able to hear where your voice rises and falls. Um, you can also hear it in the video links I provided to the performance of Othello at the Globe Theater. <clears throat> so finally, I want to just touch on some major themes that we're going to see in this play. Um, in addition to what we talked about last week, within the context of thinking of Othello as richly rewarding written text to be read and a template for performative interpretation, there are some major themes that I want everyone focusing on. So focus on representations of gender, race, and class differences. Consider the early modern stage as a place to play out ideas about difference and about, social, uh, about the social self. Consider the power of language and rhetorical manipulation. Think about the role of language and how language gets used to different effects, especially Iago's rhetoric and manipulation of reality to influence Othello. How does Shakespeare imagine the power of language to shape reality? Um, continuing with that, consider the emergence of English national identity as helping to give shape to the idea of the nation. Keep in mind that the play is set outside of England, so it's in Venice and Cyprus. Um, so we start sort of up here in Venice. Um, we end up down here in Cyprus. Remember that he's trying to help stave off this Turkish invasion. Here's Turkey. Um, this is the Mediterranean Sea right here. And then um, down here is where, um, somewhere in this region here is Northern Africa. So this is where um, Othello is from. So uh, hopefully this map gives you some sense of um, the geography of what we're looking at. England is obviously somewhere over here off the map. And then um, consider the wider implications of the play for our, our course themes. What do we learn about the communities of Venice and Cyprus, of the military? How do these communities and each character's role within these communities reflect preoccupations back in England with questions of identity, questions about political power, about social order, about the role of women and men, about the relationship between language, passion, and the power of the human mind, about attitudes towards those people who seem like outsiders to England, and about morality and the institutions that shape moral choices. So keep all this stuff in mind as you um, continue reading the play. Um, you know, think back to connections you might see between what we're reading in Othello and what we read about in Beowulf and Canterbury Tales. Keep all this in mind when we move next week into reading Paradise Lost. And um, good luck reading the rest of the play, and, and I'll look forward to talking about it further with you all on Discussion Board.